God be with you, friends. Wherever you are and whatever time of day or night, we're grateful for this opportunity to worship together. There are a few of us here in the sanctuary at Peninsula United Church on this Thursday afternoon as we prepare worship for you. Denise Grant, Angela Chu, Barb Gregg is reading scripture, Ashley McConnell and John Layton are singing hymns. Gabrielle Sutfeld is here and Gabrielle is a, a former VST classmate of mine. She was my buddy in my first year. Gabrielle is going to be leading worship next week and so she's joined us today. So I want to bring to your attention a couple of the announcements that were in the email and hope that you'll take a good look at it. Naramata Centre has started a new initiative, uh, an online work workshops for the summer and into the fall, and we've purchased our own all access pass. So take a look at your email and look at the courses that Naramata Centre uh, is offering so you can participate with them. And we hope that you might do that with a group of people from the congregation. And the other announcement is a movie that the uh, Affirming Ministry team would like you to watch. Uh, so check the email for information about the movie Love, Scott. And then we're going to gather for a conversation discussion about the movie on July 27th at 7 p.m. So let's begin our worship time now with lighting our Christ candles. And I'd invite you, if you have a candle of your own, to light it now as we remind ourselves of the presence of Christ, presence of Christ in our midst. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Let's join in the call to worship. God's spirit calls to our spirits. Inviting us to worship. God's spirit calls to our spirits. Inviting us by love. God's spirit calls to our spirits. Calling us by name. Calling us to grow in faith. Calling us to be made new. Let us respond to God's call as we worship together. Let's sing, praise God for this holy ground.
Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Life-giving God, whether or not we are aware of it, you are present at all times and all places. And because you are present, whether we're gathered here in the sanctuary or somewhere in our homes, it is holy ground and holy time. We're grateful that you hear us laughing in our times of celebration and that you hear our cries in times of trouble. We give thanks for this community gathering for worship. Help us to hear your word for us this day, whether that be a word of comfort or a word of challenge. Guide us and inspire us so that the challenges we face may become opportunities for learning and growing in love and faithfulness. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. This is the second of two stories in Genesis about Sarah's slave, Hagar. God's promise to Sarah and Abraham that they would be the parents of a great nation hinges on them having a child, but Sarah has not been able to conceive. In chapter 16, Sarah gave her slave woman, Hagar, to Abraham with the hope that God's promise as of an heir would be fulfilled by this surrogate mother. Hagar gives birth to a son, Ishmael. In today's text, Sarah gives birth to a son named Laughter, better known by his Hebrew name, Isaac. The family dynamics have changed radically now that Abraham has two sons from two women. There isn't much laughter in today's reading from Genesis 21, verses 1 to 3 and 8 to 21. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son, Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite, with, opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. 
He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our next reading is Psalm 86, which we will read responsibly. Perhaps you could imagine Hagar praying these words. What other Hagars can you imagine singing this psalm? Let's listen to the refrain and then sing it together. Turn your ear to me, O God, and answer me, for I am poor and in misery. Preserve my life, for I am faithful. Save your servant, for I trust in you. Be merciful to me, my Lord, for I call to you all day long. Gladden the heart of your servant, for to you I lift up my soul. For you, my Lord, are good and forgiving, and give in mercy to all who call on you. Give heed, O God, to my prayer, and listen to my cry of supplication. Among the gods, there is none like you, my Lord, nor can the deeds of any be compared to yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow before you. They shall glorify your name, my Lord. For you are great and do marvelous things. You alone are God. Turn to me then and have mercy. Give your strength to your servant. Save your hand, maiden's child. Give me a sign of your favor. Then those who hate me will see and be ashamed. For you, God, have helped and comforted me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Last fall, I had the opportunity of meeting with the UCW to explore some of the lesser known women of the Bible. Since we're hearing about Hagar today, she of course is another rather obscure female figure, this next hymn is especially for you United Church women. It was written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, a minister in the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Two of, our, of her hymns are in more voices. And I'm grateful that she has granted us permission to use the hymn and also given me permission to change uh, the name Hannah to Hagar. So let's sing together this hymn, God of the Women. Yes. 
The story of Hagar and Ishmael only comes around every three years in our lectionary cycle. And of the four lectionary readings for each Sunday, it's probably not the first choice of preachers. It may be that some of you have never read or heard it before. I find it a disturbing story on many levels. It's disturbing that this slave woman who has little uh, has little or no control over her life. Hagar has no choice about having sex with Abraham and having his child. She has no choice and no power when Sarah decides she no longer wants Hagar and her son in the picture. She has no security and no future when she's cast out of Abraham and Sarah's home. She is a desperate, vulnerable woman wandering with her son in the barren wilderness. This story probably hits close to home for millions of people in North America and around the world whose recent ancestors experienced the horror of slavery and are still living with after effects of that injustice. It may ring true for poor women who become surrogate mothers in some countries where there is an unregulated commercial market for babies. It may ring true for untold numbers of women and girls who are held captive and treated as commodities in an illegal sex trade. It may also ring true for women and children who are victims of violence and abuse in their own homes and communities. You may be wondering why this disturbing story was included in the Abraham and Sarah narrative by the editors of Genesis. It certainly doesn't make the parents of God's chosen people look very good, especially by today's standards. And Abraham and Sarah's story could be told without mentioning this foreign slave girl whom Abraham impregnated. So why is it here? The story of Abraham and Sarah begins in chapter 12 of Genesis. God called Abraham to leave his country and go to the land that God would show him, promising, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Abraham and Sarah had been waiting for years for the fulfillment of that promise. As they grew older and older and still without any children born to them, they took matters into their own hands. In chapter 16, we learn that Sarah gave her slave Hagar to Abraham, saying, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. As you can imagine, the surrogate birth created new problems. The dynamics in a blended family can be challenging at the best of times, never mind introducing a child of a slave woman into the mix. Things come to head at a family celebration here in our reading today. Abraham and Sarah are giving a feast to celebrate the weaning of their long awaited child, Isaac. The feast represented a milestone in Isaac's young life. In a time of high infant mortality, to reach the age of weaning indicates the child is strong enough to live and grow without breastfeeding. It indicates that Isaac has a better chance to survive and claim the promise that God had made to Abraham and Sarah. But the firstborn son of Abraham, Hagar's son, complicates matters because he was entitled to a double portion of the inheritance and a place of honor among any subsequent sons. It would be understandable if Sarah felt an urge to protect Isaac and herself and ensure Isaac's inheritance, power and privilege in the family system. 
But in order to do this, the text tells us that Sarah ordered Abraham to cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. Abraham was very distressed. He doesn't want to cast out his firstborn son. But an angel came and told him to follow Sarah's wish and promised that God would also make a nation of this son of his, born of Hagar. So Abraham gives them a little food and water and sends his son away with the boy's mother. They wander into the wilderness to almost certain death. You may have noticed that this story doesn't seem to know the genealogical notes found in chapter 16 and again at the beginning of chapter 21, which would actually make Ishmael a teenager when Isaac was born. But a mother could not carry a teenager on her shoulder, nor would she be able to cast him under a bush when the water runs out. So the boy in this text is best understood as a young child, one who cries from thirst while his mother sits far enough away to escape the pitiful cries of her thirsting, dying son. There's something very unusual in this tragic story, and it's the clue that redeems the story and to why this story may have been included in Genesis. Did you notice that Hagar's son is not named? You may remember his name from chapter 16, but in this second part of the story, when the mother and child are banished, we are not told the child's name until his death in the wilderness is imminent. Hagar sat opposite him, we're told. She lifted up her voice and she wept, and God heard the voice of the boy. God heard. In Hebrew, the first few syllables of this verse are the name Ishmael. It means God heard. It's the only time in the whole story that Ishmael's name appears, as if to emphasize the meaning of the name. God heard the voice of the boy. God hears. God sends an angel who speaks to Hagar and says what angels always say, don't be afraid. God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. So back to the question of why include this story among the narrative of Abraham and Sarah? What does it contribute to our understanding of God and God's mission in the world? The main theme of the ancestral stories in Genesis is the fulfillment of the promises God makes to Sarah and Abraham for a future with children, land, and blessing. But we would be mistaken to believe that God only cared for those identified in our Bible as God's chosen people. Hagar and Ishmael disappear from the biblical record at the end of, uh, in Genesis 21, but they do not disappear from God's bigger story. Abraham and Ishmael become the ancestors of those who follow the way of Islam, another people who love God and seek to share God's love in the world. And haven't we been blessed with our relationship with the White Rock Muslim Association that we can share together in this love of God? The story of Hagar and Ishmael serves as an important reminder, a corrective even, to notions of chosenness and election among the people of God. To be chosen as people of faith does not mean that we have a corner on God. It does not mean that God's love and care is limited to us. What is striking about Isaac and Ishmael is that God makes the same promise to them both. Each of them would become a great nation. Each of them would experience God's presence and blessing. And each of them were had a responsibility to share God's love and blessing with others. 
we know that God's love is offered to all people. And that gift of God's love brings with it both privilege and responsibility. Not privilege in the sense of more advantages, power and rights, but privilege in the sense of being blessed and entrusted with responsibility to love and care for others. We've been given the privilege of being servants of God's love. This privilege and responsibility is ours as followers of Jesus. And we have this privilege and responsibility in common with our Jewish and Islamic brothers and sisters, because Abraham is our common ancestor. This Genesis story also reminds us that God hears and loves the weak and vulnerable ones of the world. Ishmael, God hears. God hears the cries of all the Hagars and Ishmaels. God hears their cries and teaches us to listen for those cries so that we may have the privilege of sharing God's healing love in the world. Listen, God is calling. Thank you so much for your generous gifts to the church. Through your gifts, you are supporting the ministry of Peninsula United Church, which continues even when we can't meet in person. Your generous gifts also support the mission of the United Church across Canada and around the world as we share God's healing love. Thank you. Friends, as we come to the table, let's come knowing that we come in Christ's peace. So let's share Christ's peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please join with me as we sing All Who Hunger.
Let's join in our communion prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, hidden in mystery, yet broken open in bread and flowing freely from the cup. We come as your people to this table and to the tables in our homes, separated by distance, but brought together in your love. We give thanks that as we celebrate this meal, you reveal and offer yourself to us, even as you invite and empower us to follow you on your way. We do so in memory of matriarchs and patriarchs from of old, who followed your way that led from bondage and from exile into freedom and fresh hope by your powerful and renewing spirit. We do so in hope of generations yet to come, whose following of your way will rely on our own by the nurture we offer and the example we provide, by your spirit living in and working through us. We do so as disciples of the living Christ, whose life and ministry, whose dying and rising, transforms bits of bread and sips of wine or juice into this meal that forms and transforms us. We come in gratitude, raising our voices in praise. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, as a father joyfully welcomes his own, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom. From them you raised up Jesus, your son, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers are satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, though death would hunt him down. 
but with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given for you. When the supper was ended, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to you, O God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. From it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, we rejoice in the gift of your grace, remembering Christ's life and death, proclaiming his resurrec resurrection, waiting in hope for the full revelation of love incarnate. Grant that in praise and thanksgiving, we may so offer ourselves to you that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ will come again. Eternal God, send your Holy Spirit on us and on what we do, that as we share the bread and cup, we may be united with Christ, he in us and we in him, that we who are many may be one in him, fruitful in love for each other and all the world. As we remember your love, we also remember those with whom you would have us share this banquet of love, this miracle of common purpose. Aloud or in silence, we pray for those who are in sorrow or in pain, those who are ill or alone. We remember Barry, Char Barry Charlebois, Paul Piron, Grace Curry, Helen and Earl Andressen, the families of Mary Hutchison and Rebecca Irwin. We pray for those who are ill with COVID-19 and nations that are overwhelmed by large numbers of hospitalized people. We pray for the health care workers and all essential care workers. And for those who carry the loneliness and weariness of caregiving. We pray for those who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. For women and children living in neglectful or abusive situations. For those who are fleeing violence, searching for safety, peace, dignity, and opportunities for new life and meaningful work. We pray for your church and its varied ministries remembering those who have just been ordained or commissioned in our region, and for those who are beginning new pastoral relationships. We pray for Reverend Bruce and for others who are on sabbatical. We pray for the nations as they strive for peace and justice, and for the earth and the fragile web of life we share. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as our mother and father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is a meal of grace, not reward. None of us has earned a place at this table. We are invited here by the grace of God who loves us and knows our need to be replenished and made whole. As you are ready, eat and drink. Remembering that in these gifts of bread and wine, God comes to us 
so that we may come to God. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. with me. Life-giving God, we give you thanks that bread broken brings wholeness, that wine poured out replenishes, that time spent with the risen Christ and one another is gift and grace. Grant that what we have done and have been given here may so put its mark on us that it may remain always in our hearts and lead us to lives of faithful and loving action. Amen. Amen. Friends, the God who welcomed and nourished us now sends us as servants into the world to share the love we have received. May the grace of God deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness guide and sustain us today and in all of our tomorrows. Amen. Amen.